guess we'll, we'll start a little sad. Uh, where were you when you got the news today that Prince had passed? I was actually on a phone conference, and I'm working on two projects. And so I'm on a phone conference, and my phone is blowing up. Then I, my emails are blowing up. And so next thing I know, I get a call from my wife. So that's the only somebody I'm going to stop for the phone conference. And she's like, uh, have you heard? And I knew, it, I knew he'd been sick. So when she said, had you heard, I, you know, I went and I checked. And I said, like, oh, that's why I know everybody, you know, blowing up my phone. But I I'd actually kind of looked at it. I saw it. But I, at that point, it was just TMZ news. So I wasn't really sure, but when everybody started blowing up my phone and blowing up everything, I was like, oh, okay. So it was, it was just, it, I was working, so it took me a minute to kind of process everything. And then once I processed, it was just one of those things like, well, on the one hand, we've lost someone who was very talented, who gave a lot of himself. But on the other hand, his life can be a lesson to young people who don't waste your talent. There are too many graves that have too many dreams. And so particularly as an African-American, as an African-American man trying to create his own identity, trying to create his own sound, I would say that to all children, but particularly to African-American children, um, use this as an example. It's not how long you live. It's the quality of life that you live. And I think that's the legacy he leaves us. Amongst other things. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tell me more about that legacy, at least in terms to you. I think that uh, I like uh, what the uh, critic Nelson Joy said, that, that Prince was a encyclopedia of popular music. Uh, and uh, uh, Amir Baraka, the great poet and critic, said that Prince was an example of the change in same. And, and what he means by that is that, on the one hand, Prince was deeply rooted in African-American tradition. James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, Little Richard, Parliament Funkadelic, Smokey Robinson. So you, when you heard his music, you heard that amalgamation of great black music. But he was also important because he was having his own discussion about what it meant to be an African-American individual after the, quote, civil rights movement. So uh, his music captivated people for two reasons, really. He amalgamated sounds. He blended sounds. There were very few people, maybe Stevie Wonder, uh, maybe Jimi Hendrix, you know, but there were very few people who blended music, blended sound the way that Prince did. And there were very few people who could turn a phrase, turn an image. If you just listen to his songs, Little Red Corvette, Sign of the Times, Rainbow Children, he could paint an image that would have you there. And then, you know, finally, the fact that his original mantra was individuality. Uh, create yourself, define yourself, don't let anybody put chains on you. So he just really had the whole package musically, thematically, and individually, and he spoke for a generation of young people. Made a lot, made a lot of young people want to play guitar, made a lot of young people want to be drummers, but he also influenced fashion. Uh, people don't know that he had an, a, a, a ballet was created around his music. There's been orchestras created around his music. There have been two or three fashion lines dedicated or influenced by Prince. So Prince didn't just influence people musically. He influenced people in, in, in the visual arts, graphic arts. There were two or three comic books about Prince, right? There were, at, at the height of his success, there were like three or four magazines, and two of them were, were in different languages. So this was a man who was so talented that he crossed all genres. He played with jazz folk. He played with blues people. B.B. King, you know, the great B.B. King said that, you know, one of the few people with whom he wanted to work, he never got to work was Prince. That's a heck of a compliment when people consider B.B. King is the greatest guitar player on the planet. How do you go about getting the idea to and then executing writing a book about the lyrics of Prince? Partly through his whole mantra of doing what it is that you want to do. And I knew that he, he didn't make me want to be a writer, but he definitely made me want to be an artist. Right? I was writing before I knew that I was an artist, and it was, it was through watching him and listening to him and reading him. And it, it, I met him years later after I'd written my book, but uh, it was just the fact that I knew that as a writer. James Baldwin said that the writer has to be true. And so in being true, I had to write about an artist who had probably, from an from a inspirational notion, had inspired me to the themes in which I deal in my work today. What did you discover about him when you wrote your book? Uh, what I discovered was that, and, and my book is, is strictly about his lyricism, it's about his imagery, because being a poet and a fiction writer, that, that, that was what fascinated me. And what I found is that, one, a lot of his songs stand up on the page, right? The, the Battle of the Dorothy Parker, 
uh, that reads as a poem. It's, of course, it's inspired by, you know, the poet Dorothy Parker uh, and many of his other works that were image for image. You take anybody, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, George Clinton, uh, uh, John Lennon, uh, Paul McCarthy, image for image, Prince could write on par with anybody. His metaphors, his similes, uh, the way he could turn a phrase. Uh, I was really, really uh, that affirmed writing the book about that. And then meeting him, and, and we worked. We actually worked for a year and a half on a book. He was writing a book, and we got about a chapter and a half done. What I realized was that the reason, of course, that he could turn a phrase because he was so well read. I mean, this was a guy that, and a regular dude, right? You know, a regular dude for a guy who wore makeup and heels and and and, and a shiny shirt. But when you just sat at a table and talked to him, he was so profoundly well read. Uh, his his library, his backlog of what he put in his brain, and that's another thing I tell young people: what you put in your brain. If you put Foolishness in your brain, foolishness will come out your mouth. If you put creativity in your brain, creativity will come out of your mouth. And so this was a man who put loads and loads of creativity, books, music, painting, movies, and all of that kind of flowed through his art. So when you met him, what was that like? Um, I was going to say it was surreal. You think it's going to be surreal, but he's so normal. Again, now, this is a guy in shiny clothes and makeup and heels, but... Uh, the one thing that gets you, I knew this, but a lot of things get people, his voice is very deep. So, like, they had brought me into the room. I was in Paisley Park. I was in the room. And so I could hear outside in his very deep voice, is he here? Well, I need to back up because before that time, the first time we spoke was on the phone. His publicist called me. I thought somebody was playing a joke. He called me, like, 15, 20 minutes later. And we talked on the phone for, like, an hour and a half. And it was about art. It was about music. He had read my book. He had a copy of my book. He was interested in my book. I'd written an article. What really got his interest is I'd written an article discussing how his issue with Warner Brothers was a little bit different than Michael Jackson's issue with Sony. They both had problems. Jackson's issue with Sony was more about money. Prince's issue with Warner Brothers was more about creative control. And that really piqued his interest. And so when he called, and we didn't talk about his book at all. For that hour and a half, we just talked about music. We just talked about art. And I think he was filling me out. And so when I got there... You know, he was, out in the, he was out in the hallway, and I, you know, I hear, is he here? And so he walked in, and we had a two-hour conversation, and the mistake I made was that he doesn't like people to take notes, right? So I'm, we're having this great conversation, I'm thinking, oh, okay, this may be for the book. So I get in my book bag, and I pull out of my book bag, and I start writing, and he just shuts down completely. So now I'm like, oh, that's right. So I now I have to slide my notes back down and start talking, but in about two or three, two or three you know, seconds, he starts back talking, I go back to the hotel, because remember, I, I, I didn't write this. Remember all this? I write all this. I come up with about five pages. I go home. I email it to him, because I fly out that night. The very next day, I email it to him. And he paid me the two biggest compliments that any artist could pay me. And it, it really motivated me. The first thing he wanted to know, he was like, did you write this already? I was like, no, this is from our conversations. And he was like, there are very few people work as fast as I do. I knew I had the right person. That's right. And then the second thing is in that chapter, he talked about, we came up with the definition that he wanted to use for art. And he said that this is, this is the best definition for art I've ever had. And so those two things, my head was like, right, because you had to play cool. Like, oh, okay, you're good, Ben. We'll, we'll, we'll work with it. We'll go with it. So, but it was, it was working with somebody who had dedicated his entire life to his art. And I, I, I'll leave you with this. The thing that most motivated me, when I was 15 years old, I read an article by Prince and Rolling Stone, and he said that when my friends were playing, I was working. When they were asleep, I was jamming. Every morning they awoke, I had a new groove. At 15, it clicked. He wasn't great because he was talented. He was great because he outworked them. So whatever story you tell about Prince, the music and everything else, please tell that this is a man who dedicated his life to his art and worked every day. And if we had more young people who had that work ethic, Prince is, is going to be an example of a lot of things. But the one thing that gets missed is that he wasn't great because he was talented. He was great because he worked. So give me the timeline of when you met him and went up there. When was, how long ago? That was around 2002. And yeah. so we kind of stayed in and out of touch, you know, heavily 2002, 2003. The last time we spoke was 2004. So, like, I haven't had any 
connections with him since then. I know some people that he knows. Uh, I, was, I was in contact with uh, Pepe Willie. Pepe Willie is actually the guy who helped Prince write songs. He actually helped Prince kind of organize his first band. And so I talked to Pepe uh, uh, a few times. A couple of other folks I got to talk to. I talked to Des Dickerson, who was Prince's original uh, guitarist. And, 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 and just met a whole lot of people from that Minneapolis scene. Uh, but, yeah, so 2002 would have been roughly the time that we worked on it for about a, about a year and a half. You put all those times together, about a year and a half. And we, like I said, we ended up with about a, a, a chapter and a half of, uh, of work. And what I'm interested to see is that supposedly he had taken 50 pages to the, the – he was getting ready to write his memoir. So he had taken 50 pages. And, again, I don't know. Let me be clear. I don't know what's in those 50 pages, but I'm really interested to see – if some of what we did was going to make it, uh, because he had a lot of great things. Now, the book we were writing wasn't a memoir. He wanted to write a book about art, religion, and black culture. And he wanted to talk about how religion and art had always been important to black people. So I don't know how much of that theme he's going to keep you know, in his memoirs. So how many shows have you seen of his? Embarrassingly, I can say I lost count after 50. Like, uh, I, I literally... Uh, from seeing Prince open for Rick James, you know, the, 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 that tour until... Uh, now, would that have been the one that came through Jackson? That would have been the one that came through Jackson. Uh, but actually, I did, the one was in Memphis was the one I got. Because okay. I, was, I was in Clarksdale. So I was, I was, I was closer that's to... Where you were I'm, I'm originally from, right, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so that, that's where I would have, uh, I would have seen it would have been the Memphis show. And just uh, a lot of times going to Minneapolis, the best shows for me was... Prince would always play shows at 1 a.m. at Paisley Park. I mean, and don't get me wrong, the regular stadium shows, you buy your ticket like a fan, but to have been to several shows at Paisley Park, uh, to been to see, his shows, they start at 1 a.m., and you walk out in this daylight. Like, Prince, like, one, one time at Paisley Park, Prince like to dance us to death. I mean, you know, you, we was like, dog, we, like, we get it, dude. We, you got 2,000 songs. We get it. We give. No moss, right? And, and, and his band was so tight that they could just crank out songs. I got to go to the, he gave a great show at the Coliseum. I want to say 96. He gave a great show at the Coliseum in 96. But the best show was the show that he gave at the dock on the reservoir after. He played an hour and maybe 15 minutes, hour, and he did a lot of like soul and, 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 and funk and blues covers at, at, at the dock. Uh, I was so sorry to see the dock go, uh, by the way. That was an institution in Jackson. but. It's kind of like a loaded and open-ended question, but how was he able to become an icon and kind of maintain it for 25, 30 years, really? That Prince was dedicated to music and only music. He wasn't dedicated to trends or fads, right? What he wanted to know was where was the music, where was it going, and he was always challenging himself. And in fact, that was often to the detriment of his fans. I remember at 15 listening to Around the World in a Day. And though I loved it, so he had Purple Rain. So you know, you're expecting Purple Rain too. You put on Around the World in a Day, like, what is this? This is nothing like. And I remember being 15 thinking, this is a dude whose work is so great, but who is so challenged, who's so driven by challenging himself, that there may become a time where I fall out of love with his music. Because he's truly only interested in pushing the envelope of where can he take music, right? So that's how he stayed relevant for 25 years, was that rather than trying to say, okay, this is who I am, forever and forever, amen, it was a journey. And that journey was also through his lyrics. So in the beginning, it was all about individuality, being an individual, let nobody tell you what to do. By the time you get to Love Sex in 1988, there's this kind of spiritual reawakening. There's this notion, okay, I want to be an individual, but where do I fit in the communal context? And then so he goes through that. After his battle with Warner Brothers, there becomes this very Afrocentric, this kind of, you know, hey, you know, I, I'm not really being respected. Is there a reason, probably race, why I'm not being respected by my company? So then there's this whole notion about, hey, maybe instead of being a metaphysical poet, I need to be a much more physical poet and deal with tangible issues in which everybody else is dealing. So because he never stopped growing as a human being, his art never stopped growing. So that's one lesson that all artists could take, that if you want your art to grow, 
you have to continue to grow. The minute an artist says, I have my voice, that's when you stop. But as long as you know that you will grow, right? Um, a great poet, uh, uh, Amazu Bowden, told me, he said, the great thing about being a poet is every 10 years I get to rewrite all my poems. He said, because how I felt about love at 20 is not how I felt about love at 30. And how I felt about love at 30 is not how I felt about love at 40. And you could see that with Prince. You could see where he would deal with certain issues. And you would see in those early albums, and then 10 years later, he's dealing with the same subject. The, the, here's a song called Race. And in Race, it's a very kind of 60s, multicultural type, hey, peace and love, all the races get together. Fast forward a few years to the album The Rainbow Children, he's still dealing with racism, but now it's a much more tangible Afrocentric. Like, yeah, we need to be multicultural, but we need to also deal with some of these real issues that black people are engaging. So you saw a person growing and always thinking about, right, has my position evolved? Had, you know, a lot of people would, got upset because, well, you know, Prince, Prince stopped cussing and Prince stopped being naked and Prince stopped doing this. And I started thinking, yeah, well, I really don't want to see a naked 50-year-old person, right? And I always tell people, would you want your father at the club with you? You know, so what I loved about Prince, and this is not a knock about other artists, right? But you see artists of Prince's age doing the same thing they did in 84. Do you really want your favorite artist or any artist to be the same dude in 84 in 2014? So I think that as a person who was always challenging himself to grow, as a person who always wanted to become a better human being and try to reflect that through his art, uh, he all, and, 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 and becoming more in tune about how his father uh, influenced him and how the relationship with his father grew and blossomed in becoming that type of person and wanting to become a better person. So that's how you stay relevant is that you never stop growing. Hope I gave you something you can find 30 seconds. And new at nine, local author C. Lee McGinnis wrote a book on Prince's lyrics with the Clarksdale native saying he eventually met Prince and saw him perform at Paisley Park, now residing in Clinton, boasting having lost count at 50 at the number of Prince shows he's attended. But it was the show after the show here he may remember most. He gave a great show at the Coliseum, I want to say 96. He gave a great show at the Coliseum in 96. But the best show was the show that he gave at the dock on the reservoir after. You know, a regular dude for a guy who wore makeup and heels and, 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 and a shiny shirt. But when you just sat at a table and talked to him, he was so profoundly well-read. McInnes' book available on Amazon. He's also an instructor in the English department at Jackson State. Music fans all over the world are mourning the loss and the death of Prince. The 7-year-old music icon was found dead this morning at his home in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Local author C. Lee McKennis wrote a book on Prince's lyrics. The Clarksdale native says he eventually met Prince and saw him perform at Paisley Park. Now residing in Clinton, McKennis boasts having lost count at 50 the number of Prince shows he has attended. But it was the show after the show here he may remember the most. Uh, he gave a great show at the Coliseum, I want to say 96. He gave a great show at the Coliseum in 96. But the best show was the show that he gave at the dock on the reservoir after. You know, a regular dude for a guy who wore makeup and heels and, 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 and a shiny shirt. But when you just sat at a table and talked to him, he was so profoundly well-read. McInnes' book is available on Amazon. He is also an instructor in the English department at Jackson State University. Well, if